So let's say the three homages. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha. I thought I would, um, I would say a word about last evening. Now, it might have been me, but I could have sworn I heard chainsaws at about 3 in the morning. Did anybody hear any chainsaws? You did. Oh, racing on the freeway. Well, maybe that's what it was. Yeah. We have a neighbor um, across from the Lotus House who's recently, I guess, uh, felled some trees. Or Anyway, there's a lot of wood in his yard, and so they've been doing a lot of chainsawing. And um, I could have sworn I heard the chainsaw at about 3 in the morning. Of course, um, I was already up, so it didn't <laughs> But I started, I wondered about the neighbors, you know. And then I began to wonder if I was just maybe going to see myself walking up the road to his house. And, you know, just like I had mentioned about doing that in Berkeley with this <laughs> fellow and the music and all. And so by that time I was wide awake. And anyway, whatever that noise was had stopped. So I figured if it was a chainsaw, then maybe one of his closer neighbors might have contacted him. So... Um, Anyway, I was awake by then, and I got up, and I was, um, you know, I was reflecting on on um, the Dharma discussion yesterday afternoon, and also just looking at some notes that I had made for the talk. And I had, I had an interesting recollection come up. There I was in the middle of the night, you know, uh, trying to get my mind active, and I, I remembered back when I was in college, and I used to be um, a night before the test, you know, do one of those all-nighters, and I would always be cramming at the last minute. And I did it for years. There was no way that I could uh, break myself of that habit. And I knew how ridiculous it was because, you know, you just feel you're mindful of all this information. And then after the test, it's gone. It's completely gone. <laughs> and you never see it again, you know. And the whole thing kind of came to, um, it came to a head um, one night when I, my roommate and I had taken a class together. It was an art history class. So what it involved was uh, looking at at photographs of various art objects and, and pictures and like it was quite a wonderful class really but what you had to do is you know you would look at these things and then you had to remember what they were and then on the test you had to give the name of what it was in the date and the style <laughs> and all of this so we were up, um, you know, I was prepared to do an all-nighter. My roommate, we were working together showing one another pictures and, you know, she would say what they were and then I, you know, she'd show me one, et cetera. Anyway, she bowed out at about one o'clock in the morning and she got a C on the test. I stayed up for another couple of hours and I got a B. And I thought, isn't this something, really? Isn't this something? This is so goofy. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I, I thought of that in terms of, you know, this is how I interpreted my training about learning how to use my mind. I mean, this is how I got through classes. I am embarrassed to say, but there you are, you know. And so I was thinking, this is the kind of the frame of mind that I came to the Dharma with, right? So when we approach the Dharma, if we are coming to it with whatever, however we were trained in our uh, educational process, whatever that is, we have to let go of that, don't we? We have to let go of it. We are not seeking information. We're not going to be tested. You know, it's a whole other thing. But it is, it is one of those um, impediments. And we have to really be compassionate toward ourselves. 
in just recognizing that habit of thought, you know, that, that um, habitual way of, of approaching things that we were trained and encouraged. Now, things are loosening up, as I understand it, a bit in the educational system. And, um, you know, various other kinds of things are being brought in, mindfulness, meditation, and all, you know, we're experimenting with some other things. So when you think about it, when we, when we find ways that might work better, then we try them. Back then, that's what we were doing. <laughs> and um, so it was an interesting uh, contemplation. So as a result of our Dharma discussion yesterday, um, I found this lovely bit by Thich Nhat Hanh called Engage Buddhism. And I just wanted to read you um, a little bit of it, and then I'm going to leave it on the in the Vimalakirti Hall coffee table there, if anybody would like to read the whole article. But he says, meditation is not to get out of society, to escape from society, to, but to prepare for a re-entry into society. We call this engaged Buddhism. When we go to a meditation center we may have the impression that we leave everything behind, family, society, and all the complications involved in them. And we come as an individual in order to practice and so search for peace. This is already an illusion. Because in Buddhism, there is no such thing as an individual. And then later on he says... How do, you expect every, how do you expect to leave everything behind when you enter a meditation center? The kind of suffering that you carry in your heart, that is society itself. You bring that with you. You bring society with you. When you meditate, it is not just for yourself. You do it for the whole society you seek solutions to your own problems, not only for yourself, but for all of us. Now, Reverend Master Jiu founded the Order of Buddhist Contemplatives. She was a contemplative. We are a contemplative order. She put her faith in meditation as a way to live in the world and to, uh, for the benefit of all beings and for herself. That was the way she saw to fulfill her bodhisattva vows. And this temple and this retreat are the fruit of that meditation of her practice. And I think those of us who were fortunate enough to have met her or knew her could say that every fiber of her being was engaged. So I think that... The term engaged Buddhism is a really juicy one when you think about it. You know, what does it really mean? And she herself was committed to this temple being a place of refuge for everybody, regardless of their views, regardless of their preferences, regardless of their affiliations. She worked very hard to maintain that. So that it would not, there would be, so that everybody would feel welcome and nobody would be excluded. And this influenced her greatly about taking stands and and speaking up for various 
kinds of, of things that she may have felt very strongly about, but she did not want to create opposites so that people would not feel welcome here. And um, when there is a new abbess or abbot inducted into our temple, there is something that they say at the gates. This is what Reverend Master Mayon said at her induction ceremony. She went to the gate outside the Lotus House, that lovely red gate, and she said, The gates of Shasta Abbey stand open wide. Whilst I remain within this place, this gate shall never be closed to any living thing. And she often will repeat that if we start getting kicky. (laughs) Yeah. And Reverend Master Jiu encouraged Sangha members to, to feel free to do what their conscience guided them to do. And her role was to point them to the precepts for guidance. So the attitude of mind with which people approached whatever they were going to do was what the place that she could offer some, some help and guidance. What they actually decided to do was up to them. And she was very clear about that. I once asked her about something, and she said, well, if it were me, I would probably do such and such. She said, but it isn't me. She said, and I don't need to take the consequences for it. So she was pointing me to what I needed to be aware of and reminding me that I was going to take the consequences for my choices. And, you know, that's what she always did. This business of taking the consequences for our choices, this is one of the things that got left out in the getting the grade. (laughs) I mean that quite seriously. That was a vital piece of our education, Um, which I don't remember. I mean, it could have been me truly, the state that I was in back in those years. It's really interesting. Because we had so little life experience, didn't we? (laughs) We were trying to learn so many things, and we really had no life experience to hang it on. So we were living in our heads a lot. And um, one of the things that's very confusing, really, is karmic consequence. In our society, we have this idea that if somebody didn't see you do something, then, um, you know, maybe you won't get the consequences for it. But, of course, Dogen addresses that very clearly when he says, avoid the company of people who are ignorant with regard to karmic consequence. If you, you know, whether or not um, you thought even what you were doing uh, was a good thing, you are going to take the consequences one way or another. And my goodness, that was really short in, in my education. Now, I think partly because, again, it was one of those things, how were, how were the adults who taught us taught? You know, the thing is, it's so obvious with physical things, isn't it? You know, we teach our kids not to touch the stove because it's hot and they'll get burned. I remember really vividly when I was about three three years old, my father told me not to play with matches. And I sat down with a book of matches. And I just lit them one after another until I burned myself. And what I remember is how angry he was with me. I mean, you know, he was angry because he was upset, <laughs> you know, how that, how that is. He was upset because I had hurt myself. But I vividly remember that whole incident, and that's how I learned to be careful with matches. 
And so we're real clear about that with our kids and their physical danger. But I think we're much less clear on the spiritual side. Yeah. So again, I think we have to be really compassionate toward ourselves and toward our our parents, teachers, you know. Um, We're learning, aren't we? (laughs) We are really learning. This is what is going on now. When we see the results of our environment, we are seeing the consequences of our actions that we have been ignoring for, you know, hundreds of years and more recently, really ignoring. So, um, this is not a punishment. This is the teaching. You know, this is the law of the universe. Karmic consequence is inexorable. So, you know what I was going to talk about today was the all is one and all is different. But we had such a living example of it last night in our Dharma discussion. And, you know, the fact that you all of us were resonating with one another was the all is one. And everyone manifesting a different facet of the Buddha's jewel. And that, to me, is the offering of lay training to take that wisdom and that compassion back to your circumstances and to offer that to light up whatever corner of the world you are in. I mean, you're already doing it. That's how you could talk about it. But what I want to say is to not underestimate for a moment the power of that, the merit of that. It is beyond anything that you can imagine. Dogen wrote about this in um, volume two of The Roar of the Tigers in this chapter on the deeper meaning of the precepts. If you have not read that chapter, I strongly recommend that you read it. Reverend Master Jiu's commentary on Dogen's, on Dogen's teaching, I'm going to share some of it with you um, because I think it will reinforce a lot of what you all said yesterday and perhaps clarify some things and probably raise more questions than it can answer because, you know, there's no answer. There's no easy answer. And perhaps no answer to a lot of of these questions. There is our aspiration and our best intention. So this chapter, this is chapter nine, and it's called Shoaku Makusa, Refrain from All Evil Whatsoever. So the, the first precept, cease from evil. Boy, this is particularly relevant, isn't it? given what's going on in the world, and of course also always in our own personal world, there really isn't any difference as we were looking at yesterday. But, uh, or and, with all of that, we often hear people say, you know, we're overwhelmed and we're despairing by the conditions, the state of the world, and we wonder, what is it that we can do? What, What will help? And um, what Dogen is pointing out and what Reverend Master G was underlining is regardless of whether or not we can see tangible results or what we had in mind, there is something greater, infinitely greater that is at work here. And this is what Dogen and Reverend Master G are, are pointing to. And um, because this teaching is so simple and direct, 
I just find it incredibly appealing, and I come back to it over and over and over again. Because it's often so hard to know what to do, but isn't it a lot easier to know what not to do? I mean, it's a good starting point, isn't it? So I think you mentioned yesterday, um, I remember anyway, <laughs> you, <laughs> I think you, you mentioned that um, sometimes it's better just to leave things alone, Helmut. Know, you said something along those lines, just to leave stuff alone. And that um, sounds like another form of ceasing from evil. Now, you know, in Buddhism, there isn't any evil. There's no evil axis out there. (laughs) In Buddhism, evil is ignorance. It is ignorance of karmic consequence. It is ignorance of that which is greater than ourselves. It is ignorance of the fact that we are all one. This is what is called evil. This is quite a different quite a different understanding. Um, And boy, is that really important to keep in mind because so easy to slip back into that uh, other definition and understanding that we were brought up with, you know. So, the first of the three pure precepts and this and Dogen um, is, says, the Buddha of long ago said in verse, refrain from all evil whatsoever, uphold and practice all that is good, and thereby you purify your own intentions. This is what all Buddhists teach. So these are the first these are the three pure, pure precepts. Cease from evil. Do only good, and do good for others. You, can, you will see how far this is from my first impression that I told you about yesterday when I first heard, do good for others. Probably that's why I'm so drawn to it. This is really my favorite chapter because it's just an endless, endless source of treasure. So Reverend Master Jiu says, the all evil whatsoever of which Dogen speaks means the evil aspects or the evil possibilities of our actions. And those aspects and possibilities are not limited simply to actions which people think of as being evil, but they can also be found in actions which are good and are neutral. She says, believe me, in doing good, there are always evil possibilities. I've told some of you in the place where I was working, we had a sign that says, the helping hand strikes again. (laughs) And then she goes on to say, and yet, each action will have its own particular form and circumstance. Thus, that which may appear evil at one time may appear good at another. So what seems good and evil um, to the judging eyes of the human being is not always the same as that which is good and evil within the unborn Buddha mind. So we need to take refuge in the Dharma, which we did yesterday. We really did. That was the Sangha refuge. And you know, there is something in the, that we recite um, when we say the renewal of vows. We give homage to the Sangha whose members are wise and compassionate. Do you remember that line? When people turn themselves around upon hearing supreme enlightenment being talked about, 
they will wish to refrain from all evil whatsoever. It's interesting. Dogen uh, talks in a bit more detail how people can come come to the Dharma because of of wanting enlightenment, and then something shifts. And the intention um, to refrain from all evil whatsoever. Once they have arrived at the point where they are no longer doing all manner of evil, the strength from their training and practice will immediately manifest itself before their very eyes. This blossoming of strength will extend beyond all places, all realms, all times, and all things. I'm going to read that again. Once they have arrived at the point where they are no longer doing all manner of evil, the strength from their training and practice will immediately manifest itself before their very eyes. This blossoming of strength will extend beyond all places. In other words, the more we practice, the stronger that the strength, right? The blossoming of our strength over over years of practice. Jim? I'm responding to a comment that someone made yesterday. Those who have arrived at this point in time may reside in some place where all manner of evil is going on, or they may be traveling back and forth there, or they may be confronted with conditions where all manner of evil actions may be going on. Yet they do not perform evil actions themselves because they are clearly manifesting the strength from their self-restraint. Isn't that something really, you know, that we can just trust ourselves? Traveling back and forth where all manner of evil is going on. I mean, that really addresses just about all the dark places you can think of, doesn't it? They do not perform these actions themselves because they are clearly manifesting the strength from their self-restraint. And of course, we hear about people who are training in those circumstances, don't we? And the effect of their restraint and their ability to refrain from getting involved in what is going on around them has a ripple effect that we can't even begin to see or know about. Um, So, Reverend Master Jiu says, we should know that it is our pure intent, our constant attempt to refrain from evil, which is the greatest of all training. As I have said many times, one cannot have a great understanding of the truth until one has rooted out the attachments. And this is actualized by the constant attempt to cease from evil, the will to cease from evil. And then she goes on to say, In the passage above, you'll note that Dogen speaks of self-restraint. He does not speak of attempting to destroy or defeat evil. We attempt to destroy things so as to get rid of them forever, but it doesn't work that way. We need to be able... To learn to live with them. With. We need to learn to live with them. With self-restraint. 
This is what I mean when I say the attachments must be rooted out. I do not mean that they shall never rise again. I mean that training is constant, practice is constant, refraining from all evil is constant. That's why we say the Kesa verse every day, just for that day. It's just for that day. Because that's all we can do, really. (laughs) I mean, we can make all kinds of promises, but really, what do we feel we can really do? I know I've told this before, but this is one of these things that has stayed in my mind all these years. Someone said to Reverend Master Giu at a talk, I want to give up smoking for the rest of my life. I don't ever want to have a cigarette again. Do you have any advice for me? And she said, well, can you go the next five minutes without a cigarette? And she said, then after that, can you go the next five minutes? And that's, that's the way we do it. I mean, here we are, monks in the monastery. We take this vow of precepts every day. Every day we do it. And Reverend Master Man reminds us, this is the most important thing we're going to say all day. Let's say it loudly and together. This is the most important thing we're going to say. Actually, it's the first thing we say. Isn't that good? <laughs> Dogen says, rouse your heart and mind fully and do your training in practice. For when you rouse your heart and mind to do the training in practice, you will have already attained eight or nine-tenths of the way. The aspiration, the effort. Isn't that interesting? You know, we've heard that for years. I remember hearing that right when I was given meditation instruction, the effort to bring your mind back. But nobody wants to believe that <laughs> because we're, we want it to be something else. We're looking at something else. See, we're actually looking for something that isn't even there. The one thing we can do is bring our mind back. You know, but it's so ordinary. Isn't that ordinary? And yet that's really what it is. That's why Dogen said, to live by Zen is to live an ordinary daily life. So then Dogen goes on to say, before you know it, you will have refraining always in the back of your mind. And Reverend Master Jiu says, this is a wonderful thing. The great majority of refraining arises naturally when one rouses one's heart and mind and simply does the practice. We also make use of our wise discernment and we learn from our karma. These two should be understood as rousing our heart and mind fully. How many times have we been told, just do the practice? You know, you can bring all kinds of problems and difficulties to spiritual counseling. What you'll hear is just sit still and just do the practice, you know. So... um, Learn Master Jew says, with this understanding, refrain from evil, we're now ready to hear about the second pure precept, do only good. Uphold and practice all that is good. Dogen says, this does not mean that what is good is already exists somewhere and is waiting for somebody to put it into operation. Isn't that an interesting way of putting it? You know, we might even not know we're thinking that until we hear that. There's some good out there, and we are looking for somebody to put it into practice. 
At this very moment, when someone does good, there is nothing good that does not come forth. Although the myriad expressions of goodness are without an outer form. Whew, I'm sorry. Although the myriad expressions of goodness are without an outer form, when good is done, it attracts goodness faster than a magnet attracts iron. Even the strength amassed by the karma from the great earth with its mountains and rivers, as well as from the world, with its nations and countries, will never hinder the accumulating of good. There is something bigger that is holding all of us. Including everything that is going on Even so, what is good depends on what world you are talking about, for it will not always be perceived as being the same thing, since people consider what is good from their own perspective. All right, we are looking with the eyes of the Buddha. That is what Dogen is holding out to us. This is what it looks like as far as we can tell, as far as he can... This is what he's pointing to, you know. Who knows really what it looks like. This is as close as we can get. It's close enough for me. This is the reason why Dogen says, to purify the heart is the very same as to refrain from evil. The refraining itself is the purification. So don't worry about how to purify your heart. Just refrain from evil. That purification will happen automatically as a result of refraining and of meditation. We don't have to worry about the analysis of how or why. Just refrain from that which is not to be done. So then Reverend Master Jiu goes on to say, as with things not to be done, there is simply that which is good to do. And the power of doing this good cannot be overemphasized. As with evil, what is perceived as being good will vary according to the social structure of the time and the political situation. For example, what the monks of one monastery may do is sometimes thought of as good by one person and not good by another. Some Buddhist religious orders go out and engage in political or social demonstrations. By some people, this will seem to be good. By others, it will not be. As with evil, no act is good in in an eternal and unmoving way, in the sense that it is so viewed by a God, for the unborn is and neither judges nor views. There is simply the essence of that which is good to do. The intent to do good, like the intent to refrain from evil, is an important part of this. Furthermore, the principle of doing good can run contrary to some of the prevailing theories of morality and law in a given country. At the same time, Buddhism has always taught respect for the laws of the land. If we perceive that a law operates against what is good, we work within the system to change the law, not to have a riot. The truth can be voiced in all times and at all places. Just its manner and form are different according to circumstances. Recognizing what is not to be done, recognizing what is good to do, and intending to do the good, we then ask, act within the best of our ability. We may be wrong, but the unborn does not hold this against us. 
So I encourage you to read the rest of it. One of the things that has always made me very sad and that I hear, uh, have heard often from, from people, and understandably so, is people um, will say, gee, it's easy for, for all of you. You live here in a monastery. Everybody here is of like mind. Nobody out there is keeping the precepts. You know, how do you train out there with all of that stuff going on? Now, in, in recent years, we have been fortunate enough to be able to go out of the temple in our robes. You know, we can wear our robes. When we first came here, we didn't. We used to go in mufti because Reverend Master Jiu did not want the town people to feel uncomfortable. You know, he, people didn't know anything about Zen. They didn't know anything about Buddhism. She, she was concerned about the monastery, how the monastery would be accepted in the community. So you remember this was in 1970. And so um, she did a lot of things. She st- we used to have bake sales and this kind of thing so that people could come to the monastery and we had some of the monks were terrific bakers and they would make these lovely things and people could say, see, we're just ordinary people and we like to eat chocolate cake. And you know what? That must have been 30 years ago. People still ask us, are you still having bake sales? <laughs> we used to have, we used to have um, open houses of various kinds and Reverend Master would be there uh, greeting people. She did this out of her great compassion. This was such an act of wisdom and compassion because she did not want people to be afraid and she did not want people to be worried and wonder what the heck their neighbors were up to. So we used to go, we used to go into into town and we would wear beige clothes and the women would, we wore wigs (laughs) or a scarf around our heads. So of course the townspeople knew exactly who we were. So they used to call us reverend, you know. But anyway, you see what she was trying to do. And, you know, back in those days also, you, you couldn't get a driver's license um, with, a sh- with a shaved head if you were a woman. You know, they wouldn't let you, so you had, you had to wear a wig. So I remember wearing a wig. When my driver's license came, I didn't know it was me. <laughs> I remember saying... I remember when Mr. Kinray was the guest master and I was his, his assistant. I got this in the mail. What is this? <laughs> he said, it's you. <laughs> anyway, anyway, that chapter is behind us. <laughs> and it is a wonderful thing going out in our robes. People come and ask us about the Dharma. And um, one of the most moving experiences that I can remember, and I may have mentioned this to a few of you, was one day I was in Walmart and I was um, trying to make up my mind about the 16 different kinds of toothpaste on the shelf there. And I was standing there for a long time and this man came up to me and he was um, he was wearing uh, he was wearing a you know a blue shirt with his name on it and a and a, a cap with a bill. I thought he worked there, but he came up to me and he said, "Are you a Buddhist?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Well, can I ask you a question?" He said, "The Bible says um, not to kill people, but it doesn't say anything about animals or insects." He said, "What about killing?" Mosquitoes that have malaria that are that are uh, attacking children in Africa. What about that? What is what should we be doing about that? And I realized that you know there had been some photos on TV about um, an epidemic showing these kids, and they were trying you know to to find ways to deal with the health organization and was trying to figure out what to do. And this man wanted to know, how do we cease from evil here? What's good to do? 
What did I say? Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, the two of us just stood, you know, we I just had a quiet moment together. And I told him about the precept to do as little harm as possible. And that sometimes you have to break one precept to keep another and that there are consequences. And we do the best that we can. So, this is, you know, this is what we were talking about the other day when we respond to people, it's food and nature, then that, there's that, there's that response. Because we are all connected in this very deep and profound way that periodically we have a chance to remind ourselves about. And you know what else I realized, too? Um, I have a, I'm having a real struggle with the Internet and all this electronic stuff that is going on. And I realized at the same time that because of this kind of communication, people can see all over the world where there is suffering and can respond in this incredible way that people do when there is some kind of disaster in some part of the country, the world. This is outpouring of help. And I begin to see, you know, those thousand arms of, of, uh, of Lokiteshvara, one of them's got a TV in, in her hand, and the other one's got the internet. <laughs> you know. So, I don't know. It's an, you know, it's kind of a daily struggle. With me. How many of you had a chance to go to the Avalokiteshvara ceremony this morning? Lovely. Are there more of you that would like to go that didn't get a chance? One, two, three, four, five. We might be able to do it again. Let me see if... if the, oh, Reverend Helen, that's perfect. That's just perfect. What time did we decide? Does anybody... Five? Yeah. When I do that ceremony and when I'm the celebrant... Um, Part of, of what I try to, to ask for is that I can find Avalokiteshvara within my own heart, that we can find, we, that we can find her with our, within our own heart in the day ahead so that we can help, we can help her with her work. Sometimes I have to say, can I be still enough? Can I be quiet <laughs> You know, we ask for help for ourselves, for the community, for all beings. Now, there's something else that I that I want to say. Um, about turning the stream of compassion within. Reverend Master Ju used to talk about this all the time. And I always thought, boy, doesn't that sound terrific? What in the world is this, and how do you do it? <laughs> you know, and um, I, think, I think one of the things that we can start with is just listen to the way we talk to ourselves. And listen to the names we call ourselves. Would we dream of talking to somebody else like that? Someone said to me, um, you know, and I'm thinking of this phrase from Rules for Meditation. We talked about it yesterday. Wait a minute. Uh, It's futile to travel to other dusty countries. And then it says, forsaking your own seat. And I was thinking about that last night, and I was thinking, isn't that an interesting choice of a word to use, forsaking your own seat. 
And then I thought, you know, we actually are forsaking ourselves, right? Remember we were talking yesterday about the three refuges and running away from home? (laughs) So when we forsake ourselves, we are forsaking... um, we're turning away from ourselves, really, is what we're doing. And somebody pointed this out to me some years ago. I remember I asked this person if I could use this example because he told it to me in spiritual counseling. And I thought it was so helpful. I said, may I talk about this without using your name? And he gave permission. And what it was was he had been having a real battle with himself about some very difficult issues, which he had talked to me about over a period of time. And he finally was able to get um, kind of, you know, get some kind of purchase on it, begin to work with it. And he said the reason that he could do that was he had to say to himself... He could, he could not forsake himself. He could not forsake himself. That's how he put it. And I thought that was such a beautiful uh, way of putting it because it just captures the essence of it when we turn away from ourself, doesn't it? And isn't that what it feels like? Let's not do it. I better stop. <laughs> We're going to get together at 4 o'clock for a discussion and one of the things that I think would be really good to talk about is something that a number of you have mentioned um, I think as a result of the discussion yesterday many of you um, felt a confirmation of your practice and of your sense of um, of direction, you know, and just what the heck you're doing. It seemed like it was a real confirmation. And a number of you said, boy, is it easy to forget that. Is, you know, when you come back here, it's a, it's a way of renewing your commitment. And actually, yes, that's what we're doing, you know. We're taking refuge again. It is so easy to lose sight of that. And, of course, it's very human, right? I mean, this is, you know, we're, we started out talking about the context in which we are training, right? This is the world of samsara. So many things are pulling and distracting us. So... Let's talk this afternoon about how to remember. Now, for me, this was one of my favorite things. We used to go to the Priory and, and compare notes about ways that people had found to take refuge do, during the day. Now, if you, some of you mention, have mentioned this in passing, but I think it would be enormously helpful, do you, to share... How to stay in touch. How to stay in touch with the source throughout the day. So why don't we do that and anything else that you would like to talk about. Okay? And we'll get together at four. Thank you.